The invasion of Poland was a turning point in the 20th century. Not only did it start World War II, but it was the first great example of how the Nazi machinery operated to control an invaded country, police violence, famine, forced labor, and public executions were just some of the methods used by the Third Reich to eradicate Polish culture. Still, they failed. In this military history video we want to tell you what life was like for civilians in invaded Poland. From the ghettos and the extermination to the historic revolt in Warsaw. This is a story of great suffering, but also of resistance at any cost. On September 1, 1939, German forces invaded Poland, and within a month the Young Republic became the first great conquest of the Nazi army. The Polish rulers fled to Romania together with a few soldiers who remained alive. It was blitzkrieg in all its glory. Under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Germany and the Soviet Union shared the spoils by dividing the country in two. In the part that remained under German control, a new government composed exclusively of German officers was created. The first thing they did was set up SS units that were ordered to execute any element dangerous to the new regime. The hunt was not random, the Germans had a list of 61,000 names that included doctors, politicians, intellectuals and veterans of the First World War. In the first months of the occupation, 16,000 people were executed. But, what happened to those who didn't run away or weren't killed? The Poles who owned land or businesses were evicted and sent to ghettos and their property passed into the hands of the Third Reich immediately. Those houses and businesses were occupied by German citizens. The German government encouraged emigration to the newly conquered territory as part of that plan to completely eradicate Polish culture. The destruction strategy included the systematic closure of schools, museums, newspapers, and any local cultural institutions. Portable radios were also confiscated, vernacular music was banned, and mass book burnings were carried out. Basically, the Polish identity became illegal. By destroying these national symbols, the invading force intended to undermine any possible attempts at rebellion. Pulling down monuments was a way of pulling down the spirit of the people. The worst part was borne by the Jewish citizens, who lost all their constitutional rights. In April 1940 they were forced to build the walls of the ghetto, which they would later end up living in. A kind of prison inside Warsaw. In the Polish capital, the Jewish community was huge, it constituted about 30% of the total population. To give you an idea of overcrowding, the area designated for the Warsaw Ghetto was only 5% of the city. In this breeding ground of diseases there were outbreaks of typhus and other highly contagious infections that claimed the lives of thousands of people. The Warsaw model was replicated throughout the country. During the occupation, 300 ghettos were built, in which Jews, Slavs, Gypsies, political activists of other ethnic origins were housed, they all shared the same miserable fate. If they didn't die of hunger and overwork, diseases killed them. But life outside the ghettos was not much better. Before continuing. Do you think that World War II would have broken out in Europe even if Germany had not invaded Poland? Leave us your answer in the comment box. One of the first measures adopted by the new German government was to severely ration the food that each family received. This triggered mass famines in urban areas where subsistence farming was not possible. Poles living outside the ghetto could also be eligible for forced labor programs. Initially, any Pole over 18 years old could be sent to work centers, but after a few months the minimum age was lowered to 14 years. In the case of Jewish children, the limit was just 12 years. Almost all the recruits were sent to factories, fields and constructions throughout the invaded territory. The less fortunate were sent to work in Germany or other occupied countries and never returned home. Germany relied on Polish labor and resources to wage war against the Allied powers. As the fighting escalated, so did the industrial needs of the Third Reich. This meant more daily work and less rest. 
In rural areas, many people try to avoid conscription, but the penalty for escaping forced labor was death. In that context, it was inevitable that Polish citizens would fight back. As early as November 1939, the first underground resistance organization, the Polish Secret Army, was formed and grew steadily to 8,000 soldiers by 1941. This was replicated in various parts of the country. The cells gradually unified until they formed what became known as the Polish Underground State. It was a group of clandestine organizations that sought to keep the independence of their country alive even under the oppression of the Nazi invaders. The Polish underground state had an armed wing called the Home Army, which carried out guerrilla attacks and bombings against German forces. One of their favorite strategies was to destroy the supply lines of the Third Reich by blowing up bridges or train tracks. By 1943 that underground state had grown to 300,000 members and was powerful enough to run its own criminal courts. Hundreds of Poles suspected of collaborating with the Nazis were tried there. Ironically this backfired, as their roles in the police and media were filled by Germans who were far less sympathetic to the Poles. Of course the Third Reich did not sit idly by. After each home army attack, the SS executed hundreds of civilians at random in an attempt to demoralize the population. The bodies were displayed in the squares as a morbid warning of the price of disobedience. But far from intimidating the resistance, this infuriated them even more. In the spring of 1943 the SS entered the Warsaw Ghetto to deport Jews and transport them to extermination camps. The vast majority of these German soldiers never made it out alive. They were intercepted by the Home Army that killed dozens of Nazis with grenades and homemade weapons. Of course, life for civilians was constantly deteriorating. Greater police violence, smaller food rations and, meanwhile, the extermination plan known as the Final Solution was already underway. By 1944 German power was faltering and the Polish guerrillas were strong enough to plan large-scale organized attacks. This is how Operation Tempest was born, a series of uprisings between January 1944 and January 1945. The most important of them took place in August 1944 in the country's capital and was known as the Warsaw Uprising. Between 20,000 and 50,000 Poles fought and achieved great initial victories. But the Soviet aid never arrived, the Red Army remained waiting a few kilometers from the capital. Many historians conclude that the Soviet Union wanted that uprising to fail so that it could later liberate the country and control the population more easily. The Home Army gave battle, but could not resist the German military superiority. Warsaw was reduced to ashes along with the corpses of 200,000 Poles. Hundreds of thousands more had to flee as refugees, leaving their homes forever. The German occupation ended in 1945, ushering in a long period of Soviet control. Eighty years after the invasion began, the scars of this experience can still be felt in Poland. In the mid-1940s, the greatest fear of the French came true. The German army set out to conquer Europe, began a sweeping march to the west and entered French territory. French troops put up a fight, but it soon became clear that they were no threat to Adolf Hitler's powerful Wehrmacht. After six weeks of fighting, the Germans were victorious and occupied France. French citizens couldn't believe their eyes when they saw the Nazi flag waving on top of the Eiffel Tower, the country's greatest symbol. The same thing happened in the Palace of Versailles, which had been the residence of the French kings. At that time, no one could have imagined how much things would change from that moment on and the terrible suffering that would take over the country. The Gauls were about to know true terror. The Germans invaded France in May 1940, smashing through its defenses and entering Paris on June 14 of that same year. The French government had no choice but to sign an armistice, according to which large areas of the North and West would remain in the hands of the Third Reich. Meanwhile, the civil administration of the French Third Republic was dissolved, and in its place the Vichy state was formed, that is, a national regime sympathetic to fascism and willing to collaborate with the Nazis. 
The leader of the new government was Marshal Philippe Pétain, a soldier respected for his heroic performance at the Battle of Verdun in World War I. However, at that time Pétain was an old man in his 80s, so in practice the person in charge of running the country was Pierre Laval, a former socialist who had good relations with the Germans. It is estimated that there were 25 million people living in the regions of France occupied by the Third Reich. Their life changed drastically, first of all, because they had to get used to seeing the Nazis walking around as if they were in their country. Tanks and armored vehicles of the conquerors roamed the semi-deserted streets, the Nazi flag proudly flew on public buildings, and banners and signs written in German were posted everywhere. The French were aware that they had completely lost their autonomy, and that a foreign invader now ruled. The German army of occupation carried out an intense propaganda campaign aimed at cleaning up the image of the Nazis and portraying them as friendly neighbors who were waging a just war. The intended message was that once Hitler defeated the Allies, a new political order would be established in Europe, and France would be one of its main pillars. According to the propaganda, the Gallic nation could make significant contributions considering its rich culture. However, this was far from the truth, as the French suffered a deep psychological shock from the invasion and learned to hate the Nazis. The inhabitants of the German occupation zones had to take charge of feeding and housing the 300,000 soldiers of the Wehrmacht. At the same time, the Germans had a free hand to confiscate and requisition French properties, so an organized looting system was formed. As a result, food shortages were not long in coming, with the consequent malnutrition of large sectors of the population, particularly children and the elderly. The French government had to enact laws to ration food. Shops could deliver a limited amount of goods to people, and endless lines of people were everywhere, waiting their turn to buy some bread, meat, and milk. Each citizen was given a ticket with which they could withdraw their daily ration, which was very little and not enough to satisfy the hunger of an entire family. For this reason, an illegal food market was formed, where people could obtain food at extortionate prices. This, however, was prohibited, and a person caught with more than their fair share of food was arrested. On the other hand, a curfew was established between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. This brought as a consequence the end of nightlife in big cities like Paris. No one could leave their home without a pass signed by the authorities, and households were required to lock their doors and windows. The lights had to be turned off for fear that they would be used to send messages to Allied aircraft. Many remember that the French capital was plunged into a gloomy silence, no laughter, cars or music could be heard. The mere sound of a police alarm or an airplane was enough to send the population into a panic. Despite the terrifying nature of the situation, the Burmak took advantage of the fact that Paris was in their hands and used it as a tourist area for their troops. Many German units were rewarded with a season off in the capital, where they could visit its famous restaurants, theaters, and nightclubs. There was also an increase in prostitution, as Nazi soldiers frequently visited French brothels. As expected, the German occupation army encouraged the persecution of Jews, homosexuals, leftist militants, and trade unionists. Gallic citizens of Jewish roots were forced to embroider a yellow star on their clothes, so that they would be easily recognizable. Discriminatory measures were implemented such as forcing them to get on the last car when using the Paris underground train. Many were sent to concentration camps like Auschwitz or Dachau, where they met their deaths. The SS patrolled the streets of France and made sure that all those deemed undesirable by the regime got what they deserved. On the other hand, hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen were used as slaves and transferred to Germany as laborers in military industries. Those who rejected the Nazi dictatorship joined the resistance, which organized acts of sabotage against the invaders. The lives of those who fought for freedom, however, were fraught with danger, and the threat of death hung over their heads. Let us see the testimony of Giselle Guillemot, a member of the resistance who remembers what those terrible days were like. I was responsible for looking for supplies and important documents. To do this, together with my group we organized raids on rural town halls.
With my youthful appearance and schoolgirl outfit, no one suspected me. I was the ideal person for these missions. Even so, there were days when an uncontrollable anxiety invaded me. Seeing a man dressed in a trench coat would give me a panic attack. Hearing a suspicious noise in a stairwell made me believe that I would be arrested by the Gestapo and tortured. If I got caught, could I endure the torment without ratting out my comrades? That was my biggest fear. In June 1944, the Allies began the liberation of France, an operation in which the resistance played a leading role. In August of that same year, the German troops stationed in Paris surrendered, and the Gauls soon regained their autonomy. The leaders of the Vichy regime were prosecuted for treason, and Marshal Philippe Pétain was sentenced to life imprisonment. The true head of state, Prime Minister Pierre Laval, was sentenced to death and shot on October 15, 1945. Thus, France's darkest days came to an end. We reached the end of the video and we want to ask you, if you had lived at that time, would you have joined the French resistance? Leave us your answer in the comment box below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history.